good evening and welcome to tonight's special version of the Board of Education meeting in our continuing pursuit of our new superintendent. Uh, we have Dr. Wayne Anderson here with us this evening. Um, Member Farland has joined us. Uh, Vice President Baker will be joining us momentarily. She's en route. And uh, I think Mr. Kam Dr. Kaminsky is probably en route also. So I hope he's here shortly. What we may do is begin the meeting and we may take a two minute pause to allow people to get here, if you don't mind. Uh, as per our last board meeting, uh, we said we'd like to say the Pledge of Allegiance before the meeting begins. So now that we're called to order, if people will join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. He just arrived and we'll wait for him to call the roll when he sits in his chair. I was, uh, I was trying to run as fast as I could. <laughs> it's coming down in buckets out there right now, so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Stay cool during the meeting. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so uh, we're at the point of uh, calling the roll, John. Okay, uh, President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Baker? Uh, she's absent. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstand? Here. Member Gordon? Here. And Member um, McFarland? Here. And Member Van Vanderkellen? Here. Okay. okay. One missing? Yes, Present. and she will be here momentarily. Okay. Assuming the weather doesn't slow her travels down. Yeah, she needs a boat to get here. <laughs> <laughs> well, to remind the uh, public and our, our candidate, uh, tonight's process in the second round is uh, to have about an hour and a half's worth of interviews, which then we will adjourn or adjourn recess uh, to dinner uh, with the board and uh, Dr. Anderson and his spouse. Um, as part of the interview process, Dr. Anderson will give us a 10 minute presentation that he has prepared for us to evaluate and see his presentation and communication skills, at which point then we will begin the round robin of questions from individual board members of their choosing as we go forward. Um, so that's the agenda tonight. We can ask follow-up questions of individual board members questions, but make it a follow-up to the question, not an independent question. If you have an independent question, hold it to your round so we don't uh, take up somebody's round with uh, things that they weren't trying to ask. That said, Dr. Anderson, the podium is yours. Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me back. Uh, this is an honor. I uh, appreciate coming back. I appreciate having the opportunity to talk with each of you again. This was actually one of the most difficult things for me to do since I've, uh, uh, our last meeting. And it's not the presenting to you, it was finding a topic. So I was trying to do, I used to teach speech, so I know that when I taught speech, that you know, once you pick the topic, then it usually gets easier after that, so I had to follow my advice. I thought, well, I've been doing a lot of uh, research on finance, taking a look at the nuances between Wisconsin finance uh, system and Michigan. I said, well, I could maybe talk on that. I thought, well, maybe I should do curriculum. And it finally came to me and said, I have 10 minutes. So I thought, why don't I deal with the topic that's probably nearest and dearest to my heart? And that is, why do I want to be Midland superintendent? And the best question is, why wouldn't I want to be Midland superintendent? And taking a look at your district facilities, the Midland School District is an exceptional school district that has a proven record of academic and co-curricular success. Today I've had the ability, this is my third time, I'm not used to standing in one place, so this is going to be a little bit of a disadvantage for me. I've had the opportunity to go through uh, the Midland School District. This is my third time to be in Midland. You have a lovely community. Uh, I got a chance to tour several of the schools today to meet students, meet staff members, meet administrators. You have an exceptional school district. I think a better question would be why would someone, why would anyone not want to be the superintendent here? But to take a look, first I want to uh, list some of the strengths of the district. First, you have high levels of academic achievement. In fact, if you take a look at your test scores, I think that you're right in the top 2%. So you're already doing a great deal of good things for students here. You're giving them opportunities to better themselves as they leave the school district. You have a strong curriculum that provides a well-rounded education. So irregardless of what students have for an interest, your curriculum seems to offer them various courses that they can take that will be of interest and benefit to them. You have an excellent staff. In fact, as I looked at the various surveys that went out, 
One of the things that the community and that the board can kindly emphasize was the excellent staff that they had. You have safe, secure, and well-kept facilities. And I was able to learn on my uh, journeys that you've actually done a great deal of energy efficiency. So in uh, your director building grounds and working with the administrators and with the board, that you've done a great deal in energy conservation to help save dollars that you can redirect into other areas. You have strong extracurricular and co-curricular programs. Uh, I was reminded there is a very intense rivalry between the two high schools, but it's a very healthy rivalry between the two high schools. Uh, people are showing me the various uh, achievements that were done in athletics and in music and in drama. In fact, I was told that the one drama director is uh, actually leaving this fall, and uh, people are remorseful because she's done such a good job, and she had a well-rounded display of the various accomplishments that students have had over uh, the time period. And it's a forward-thinking district. I know that one of your aims is that you want to be on the cutting edge. You want to be the district that goes to the next level. Now, defining the next level is probably a, something that's for the whole community. What is the next level to the community? What is the next level to the board and to staff? But whatever that level is defined as, you want to be continually progressing. In looking at your community, you have a community that's active and supportive. In 2010, you were named the number four best small city to raise a family. It's too bad my family's grown, but my grandchildren are here, and I, uh, if I'm fortunate enough to get this job, I'm sure they'll be spending many summers with grandpa and grandma. You're the global headquarters of both Dow Chemical and Dow Corning Corporation. I know there are business ties. In fact, as I was going through the day, I was made aware of the many foundations that have ties with the school district and the joint partnerships that you have to increase the uh, ability that students have to take place in many different opportunities. You have a strong, vibrant business community. Uh, my wife and I last night uh, had the opportunity to walk down Main Street, which is a very beautiful place. Uh, we were very impressed. It's, uh, it's much more attractive than uh, many of the Main Streets I've ever been in. You have the Midland Center for the Arts. So you not only have athletic fields, and I did get to go by uh, the Dow Field, and I did get to see uh, various, the, the tennis courts, but you have Midland. So you're you have diversity for if people have an interest in something, this community is trying to reach to make sure that they have great facilities for whatever area of interest. And you have abundance of recreational facilities and parks. I like to ride bike, and I notice that you have miles and miles of paved uh, biking. I used to run, but my knee gave out, so the doctor told me just concentrate on bike riding. Every district has challenges. What do I see as the challenges, or what did you see as the challenges? One, uh, finances. Currently, your expenditures exceed your revenues, and that's something that obviously you can't do in the long term. In the short term, you have a fund balance that you are able to balance your budget with, but obviously you can only do that for so many years. You have to find a way to turn that around. Communications both internally and externally. If you take a look at the document that uh, was presented um, that by the survey company that went out and tried to elicit opinion, one of the things that was brought up uh, in the document was that they wanted communications to improve both within the district and with entities outside of the district. Improve relationships with staff and the community. I met with one of the uh, meetings I had today was with the uh, teachers union. And of course, we had a very good discussion and we talked about communication and how we could take communication from where it currently is and how that communication might be modified or improved. I know you have changing demographics and you have expectations that are still high. You have a group of, you have more than a group of individuals. I think you have a community as a whole that has very high expectations for the school district. You have demographics that are changing. You have, um, I would say, uh, no pun intended, but you have a graying population. I probably would add to that population. It's a little gray. But you have less um, parents that are of childbearing age. Though the population of Midland is remaining fairly constant, what you're finding is that the age population of that population is changing. And a vision for the future. Right now, you're coming at the end of your strategic plan. You're ready to start another strategic plan. I think what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to engage the staff and the community to determine where is it that you would like to see this community in the future. Once you know where that is and once you know when you'd like to be there, then I think plans can be set up to get you from where you are currently now to where you'd like to be in the future. Why should you choose me? I'm going to go to the last because I have really a strong desire to be. 
uh, as I had a chance to meet more and more people, you have lots of dedicated staff. You have dedicated administrators that I was meet. You have dedicated teachers that came through in all of your surveys. I had a great time meeting them. I had a great time talking to the students when I was in the building. So I have a very strong desire to be a part of your team. I have a strong financial background. I don't know all the nuances of Michigan's finance law. I've done my best to try to get uh, more up to speed during uh, since our last meeting. But there are nuances that I still don't know, and I'll be the first to admit that. But I do have a strong knowledge on how budgets work and how you work with individuals to create a budget and then to implement a budget. Good oral written communication skills. Obviously, I'm a little nervous, so there's a little breaking in my voice, but overall, I love talking to people. I enjoy writing. I enjoy speaking. I try to make the information that I have clear and understandable. I have a history of creating strong relationships with staff and community. I have always encouraged everyone to make phone calls and reference checks to the individuals that live within my school district. Not that everyone would say that they agree with me, not that everyone would say that they like me. But I think that individuals as a whole, uh, when you talk to them, will say that I was honest, I was upfront, and that I communicated the needs of the district in a way that people could understand. Integrity, ethics, and values. Um, I just had my retirement uh, party for my own district uh, this past Saturday, and uh, there were tributes that were given. In fact, the district made a um, DVD and went around talking to various staff members throughout the district. The one thing that almost all of them said was that I was a man of high integrity. I think the best one I saw was I was integrity with the time. A risk taker. You can't go forward without taking risks. If you're only with the status quo, you're going to fall behind. You're not going to stay the same. You're actually going to go behind. So what you need to do is you need to allow individuals, because you have all the skills necessary within this school district, to move forward. It's not that you need something from the outside. When I, if I'm fortunate enough to come here, I don't have the answers to what will bring you forward. What I do have is I have the skills to work with the individuals already in your district, within your staff, within your administrative team, within your community, to work with them to find the solutions to the issues that you have. If you take risks, you can go forward. If you allow individuals a chance to experiment, to try some of the ideas that they have to make things better, I think overall you will find that education improves at a much faster rate and people are happier. People are happy because they have pent up desires on things that they want to try. What you have to do is try to eliminate that fear of failure where they think if they try something and it doesn't work that they're not going to succeed. And I'll finish where I started on this. I have a strong desire to be part of your team. I have enjoyed the opportunities I've had to be here. I hope I have the opportunities for more meetings like this in the future. And I think I made it within 10 minutes. Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done. Um, and with that, before we move into questions for Dr. Anderson, I was remiss. Um, we will do a request to address the board after the interview, because I forgot to miss that. And secondly, I do have an announcement to make. Um, uh, Dr. Jeff Hall has excused himself from our search process. Um, felt there was, uh, I won't go into the reasons, but the one reason he cited was unfinished business he needed to complete in his current district. And so there will not be interviews tomorrow evening with, uh, with, with Dr. Hall. Uh, the next interview will be Wednesday night um, with Mr. Sharo from Algonac. And then the decision meeting will still be Thursday night at 7 o'clock as we go forward. So thank you. My pardons for not getting that out before we started. Um, we'll now begin with the questions. For Dr. Anderson, um, why don't I start to my right this time? Uh, are you familiar with the ASBO Meritorious Budget Award? No, I'm not. It says a well thought out, well communicated budget is vital to de developing the support of the school district stakeholders and promoting transparency and accountability. The Meritorious Budget Award, sponsored by ASBO International, promotes and recognizes excellence in school budget presentation and enhances school business officials' skills in developing, analyzing, and presenting a school system budget and reviews the accounting practices and reporting procedures. Uh, there are five schools that won the Meritorious Budget Award last year, including Bloomfield Hills, Farmington Public School, Grand Blank Community Schools, South Line Community Schools, Wild Lake Consolidated School District. Our new auditor, Dave Youngstrom from Yo and Yo, worked with Bloomfield Hills to achieve 
to help them achieve this award. Will you provide the leadership and would you be willing to work with Dave Youngstrom so Midland Public Schools will join this prestigious group and achieve the ASBO Meritorious Budget Award, which aligns the budget with proper class sizes? The easy answer would be yes. I think one step back is that we may not have that in Wisconsin that I know of. However, we have the uh, Wisconsin Manufacturing Commerce gives out awards for those uh, school districts that are able to do above average academically at below average cost. We won that every year that they gave the award out. So they gave the award out for basically 10 years. Mount Horb won that every year in the 10 years. We always exceeded uh, the expectations for student achievement. We always did that at a cost that was lower than the state average. Excellent. Will you work in this district to receive this award? That yeah. sounds very similar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lynn. Well, Dr. Anderson, I apologize that I haven't met you before tonight. I, I got into town about uh, 45 minutes ago, so I've been gone for two weeks. But I did hear your voice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In, sitting in a parking lot in the dark, so <laughs> I'm glad to meet you in this way. And question-wise, I guess, Jerry, I am just going to ask a couple questions that I had asked That's in my other round because I assumed they hadn't been asked. And you may have already answered these questions, but it would be wonderful for me. Okay. Please describe your leadership and communication style, how you make decisions, resolve conflicts, work with your executive team, administrators, staff, board of education, and move the organization forward. And can you give an example of a complex problem you faced in the process you used to resolve it? And I would have, be happy to repeat any of that if, if need be. Well, the leadership part is I consider myself one among equals. In other words, so the period, pyramid doesn't have a point. What I look at is that my job isn't more important than other people's job. It's just different. Every one of us have certain roles. If we all do our roles in the district, the district moves forward. If we don't all do our roles in the district, the district doesn't move forward, or at least it doesn't move forward as fast. An example I gave for that is that the one word you can't use in my district is, I'm just, because everyone has an important role to play. My role might be a little different. I meet with the bus drivers at the beginning of the year, and I remind them that they are the very first face that students see when they come into the, when they're entering the bus, that the smile and the greeting they give them starts their day off. They're also the very last face they see when they get off the bus. So they start the student's day and they end the student's day. The food service, I remind them that in the way that they serve the food that we present, and we serve nutritious meals, but in the way that we do that in a way that reminds the individuals that we're providing them the nutrition that they need to, for the energy they have in the afternoon, and that the way that they do that, so when they do that with a smile, when they do that greeting the students, that cheers them up in the middle of the day. Our custodial staff, many of them, make connections with the students because students see them in the halls, either before school, during school, or after school. So these make relationships. Our secretaries, of course, they actually run our buildings for all practical purposes, and they truly are become the moms to many of the students helping individuals out. The teachers, of course, they're the front line. They're the ones who are actually moving the students forward. When they believe in the students and they believe in their capacity to learn, and the students realize that these individuals are truly there for their benefit, that's when education happens. Administrators help to create the paths for the teachers to do their jobs. So I say my job is different. There has to be some individual that when a final decision has to be made, there has to be a desk for it to land on. That oftentimes is my, um, my desk. But it doesn't mean that my role is more important than their role. It just means that my role is different than their role. Now, in, in dealing with leadership, I believe in surrounding myself with individuals that are more capable than I am. And I don't mean, to, uh, as I told the board the last time, my wife always gets angry, and when she watches this videotape, she'll get angry at me again. But that doesn't mean that I'm not uh, competent and capable. What it means is that I can't be an expert in all areas. So I surround myself with uh, individuals who are um, extremely competent in the areas that they focus on. And then my job is to coordinate their efforts to help move the district forward. Uh, communicate, I believe in communicating by relationship. I think more things happen when uh, trusting relationships exist between people. Uh, trusting relationships take time. People don't trust you because you say you, you're trustworthy. People trust you because they see that the actions follow the deeds. So it takes a period of time, but I think that the relationships grow when you're truly listening to what other people have to say. So they know that 
You may not agree with them and they may not agree with you, but you've truly listened to their point of view. You've considered their point of view. Sometimes that modifies your own, but they know that they're being heard. So those are some of the things that I do. Um, I personally like lots of face-to-face -face communication, uh, but I was an English teacher. So what I learned a couple years ago is that one way to get the message out to more people is through a blog. The blog isn't a weekly a blog I uh, have done the last four years, and I do it basically as topics come up. So as a topic comes up that the public is interested and wants to know more about, and the board takes some type of action, then I inform the community, and one of the vehicles that we use is the blog. We also use the local paper. I don't know if you said communications with board, but mm -hmm. just in case, uh, I believe the board should always, uh, they should never be taken by surprise. So one of the things that I do for our current board is every Thursday I write what's called district details, which describes what's going on uh, within the district. We meet the first and third Mondays of every month, so the Thursday prior to that, I'll take every uh, item that's on the board agenda, and I'll describe that item uh, to the board. If it's an action on, I'll tell them what the action is and why I'm recommending certain action, so that when they're dealing with those uh, in, you know, at the board meeting, they've had some time to think and reflect on it before the actual meeting begins. If something were to happen in our schools, like an ambulance goes to one of our schools, I would usually email or phone and say we had an, uh, an asthma attack, uh, the ambulance picked up, the parents have been notified, the student is fine. So if they get a call, they, they can say, yes, we're aware of that situation, but thank you for letting me know. Is there any parts that I missed? Um, only if you would have an ex example of a complex problem that you can recall that and how you solved that. Well, one of the complex problems we're dealing with right now, and it's not solved, is the Affordable Care Act. Uh, as we're putting together our budget, uh, one of the things with the Affordable Care Act is that uh, basically it's providing health insurance to all individuals who work 30 hours or more per week. That has not been traditionally done in our school district. Our paraprofessionals are the best example. Uh, many of those uh, work about 35 hours per week, but we had never designed to pay health insurance uh, within the district. Now we're realizing that that will be an expectation uh, starting on July 1st, 2014. Next year will be our year of measurement, so those that qualify next year will then uh, be entitled to the insurance on July 1st. With non-discrimination, it means that basically the insurance plan will have to be one that's uh, fairly similar for all employees. Right now, for us, that would cost us, at today's uh, rate, between three-quarters of a million and a million dollars. Uh, our governors decided that education doesn't need any additional funds, so we have a $0 increase. We're in, uh, we are an increasing enrollment district, which means we will receive $82,000 in additional funds next year. Our health insurance increase alone uh, went up 10% uh, and 4% additional for affordable health care, so not between about $350,000. So we've had to work is not only how to solve the issue for this year, but for the upcoming year. What we've done is for this year, we worked with uh, all the staff members, including those who uh, will be eligible for health insurance, to put together eight different options to find out which they would like. They just, uh, the surveys came back. We are actually gonna change our health insurance carrier and make some minor changes to our plan so that it basically will become cost neutral. We've also taken basically our 51 employees uh, that would be affected uh, for 2014. Uh, 15 of those now will remain full-time over 30 hours a week and we are budgeting for their health insurance. The other uh, 36 will continue to have a job because we wanted to make sure that everyone uh, remained employed, but we're going to reduce ours to less than 30. So that's a complex problem. That's where we are in the solution at this point, uh, but it's not finalized yet. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Dr. Anderson, in your first interview with us, you talked about um, employee relations at Mount Horeb, and it seemed to be sort of a source of pride for you that you have excellent in, uh, employee relations between staff and administration. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about why that's such a source of pride for you, and, and then tell me how do you build those kind of good relationships and how do you maintain them, especially when we're kind of in an era of having to cut things, how do you maintain those good relationships with the staff? One of the things I want to start with is I'm glad that you have these televised because when you have them televised, it allowed me to uh, basically watch some of the discussion. And one of the things that I sometimes take for granted is I've been in Mount Horb 17 years, so 
what is occurring now. Sometimes I forget it didn't always occur that way, and I may not make that clear. Um, when I first came to Mount Hora, uh, the uh, staff had just lost an arbitration suit. So uh, we were the lowest paid district in the state. We are going to continue to be the lowest paid because uh, of the arbitration suit. So teachers basically were wearing black armbands. Um, teachers uh, all came into buildings at the same time. Teachers all exited at the same time. Teachers refused to do anything that wasn't contracted. That's when I started with the district. But what developed over time was a trusting relationship. And the reason I have a source of pride is because I think that's where problems are solved. Problems aren't solved by any one individual. Problems are solved by um, groups of individuals that work together for a common cause. So when the groups work together and people feel happy about where they work and they feel proud about where they're going to work, they actually work much harder. So I think what um, over the time period, people may not always agree with the decisions that I've made, but they know that I made them with uh, the best information I had at the time. I tried to communicate the reasons for why a decision was made. Um, I try to be sympathetic um, to what circumstances it might put others in. It didn't mean I could always change them. If it was feasible that I could modify it so it didn't have quite as negative impact, I was considered what that would happen. So over the years, people have basically come to recognize that I may not have all the answers, but I will seek input from a multitude of sources I, once I seek that input, I'll put it together in a format that people can understand. I'll make then the decision, and then I'll move forward with the implementation. Um, and they realize that what they hear from me directly is what they would hear irregardless of where they are. So people have come to uh, trust and respect me that uh, even if they disagree with my decision, they know that uh, it was made with the best intentions at the time. Uh, and like I said, the reason I take such pride in think that is what has made our district grow. Um, during uh, Act 10, which happened in Wisconsin, was basically destroyed all collective bargaining rights. It was a time when most districts in the state had um, extremely low morale. Um, what I had recommended to our district and our district took up was, since we had to create an employee handbook, the best way to do that would be to involve employees. So I asked, uh, I said, please let the uh, teachers union appoint teachers, let the support staff union uh, pick their employees to represent the administrators, so all groups sat together at the table. They were all open meetings. We used 40 to 50 staff, and we worked through the process. When the process was done, it took about a year. Um, it wasn't a handbook that everybody said, gee, we liked everything in it. But every one of the groups told the board on a continual basis, we're happy that you gave us the input. We know you didn't have to do this. We know many of our colleagues in other districts were just handed a handbook. We had input, and we appreciate the input. So I think that kept the morale in our district much higher. We've just finished the re review process. So I think when individuals realize that they have input into decisions that affect them, um, they work harder. And I've always believed that when people enjoy coming to work, people produce at a much higher level. Not a very succinct answer, but. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Guess I'll go to me. Um, we see you've conducted a variety of approaches to balancing budgets in our last interview, et cetera. Um, with Michigan uh, law being such that the revenue enhancement is limited in both number and scope, can you give some ex examples of what you've done on the cost-saving methods you've used at Mount Horeb? What we've done, and uh, I have tried um, to, uh, to learn the nuance, nuances of uh, the system. Uh, there are some changes. Uh, one of the nice things is you have an excellent business manager, so though I understand the general concepts, she'll be able to explain the details. But what I've been able to do that I think every district has the options, including the districts in Michigan, is one, we sat down with the teachers uh, when we had a uh, shortfall, and we said, look, we've made a commitment to try to not lay off any staff, but at that point we were about, I think we had got down to about $1.2 million that we still needed to cut. So the teachers basically at that time said, uh, we have uh, supplies and materials that uh, we have basically squirreled away, so we think that for a year we could probably reduce our uh, supply material budget by about 600000 So that got us part way there. We then looked at retirement savings. When uh, a teacher retires from our district, when we hire a new teacher at, uh, towards the beginning, we save about $15,000 a staff member. And that's for those staff members that we pay six years of health insurance when they leave. So when they leave a district, we pay for the next six years of their health insurance. 
So when we even take that section out, we saved about 15,000. So uh, over the past couple of years, uh, we've had between 10 and 20 retirements. That helped save us at 15,000, between 150 and $300,000. It did mean we had less personnel, but it did mean that the cost of the personnel was less. In some cases, we did um, reduce our staff, but we did it by attrition. In other words, we didn't take a look at um, if you had a job, taking away your job, but if a position was vacated, we looked at were there ways that we could um, do without that or reposition that position or reposition that uh, uh, vacancy. So that's another thing that we've used. We've looked at energy savings. One of the things that we've done is we've spent a great deal of time reallocating our resources to put them in areas um, where it's not going to change, like for natural gas. We buy natural gas on the stock market, or just like the stock market. So we go every day, we review what the prices are, and then we lock our prices in. Well, for most of the months, and we've done this for, sometimes times escape me, but I think now probably six years. For many months, it's caused us to save money because what, the, what we were being charged if we had just been on a constant, we were able to buy it and then pay the transportation costs we were able to save money. So that was money we could redirect other places. We've changed almost all the lights out throughout our district and changed in the more energy savings. So it didn't that it so much affected, the rooms are still well lit, but the rooms are lit using a lower voltage. We put basically light sensors in almost all our rooms so when people leave the rooms after a period of time, the lights shut off. So we looked at ways that we could take energy savings and redirect that to other portions. We've refinanced our debt. We don't have a lot of debt, even though we've passed four referendums. We will be debt free, I think in about, even with the last referendum, I think 12 to 14 years. But we've restructured our debt to take advantage of low interest rates so that we've reduced our interest payments. So those are some of the methods that we've used to balance budgets and still maintain staff. Oh, and one other one that's not popular, uh, but um, it's probably the largest one actually. Um, we've had salary freezes. But we freeze across the board. So two years ago, uh, every district, every individual in the district had a pay freeze. So my pay was frozen. Uh, administrator's pay was frozen. Uh, everyone in the district took a pay freeze in order to help balance the budget. This year, uh, coming up, right now, if the governor and the legislature does not change its approach, and we still get 82,000, all the staff is prepared that we will again take another wage freeze. Now, last year, uh, we were able to. Um, go to the CPI, which at that point was about 3.16, and the board gave the maximum amount they could to all staff members. But this year, it might be a little leaner, so everyone's already prepared. Uh, we didn't even start negotiations for base salary because the uh, leadership basically came from the union and said, we know there's no money in the budget. We know that if there isn't any, we're all going to get a pay freeze. We all understand that. We know that, you've, that if it goes to $150 per student, you've already put in the maximum amount for our increase into the next year's budget. So if we end up receiving money uh, later on in the summer, if the legislature makes a change, then they'll come forward and maybe start the negotiation process. But if it doesn't, they've all uh, accepted that all of us will take a pay freeze in order to balance the budget and save jobs. You know, we have a thing called steps in our labor contract, very common in Michigan. Is that common in Wisconsin? And did you have steps in your contract that you froze? Or is your freeze everything but the steps? No. Before, Act 10, we had steps and lanes just like you. Uh, so then it means you were froze to the, so if you made $52,196, the next year you made $52,196. We even froze lane movement. Now the next year when we did have money, we reimbursed teachers that if they had gained credits, we did make up. We didn't pay them you know, two years worth, but if they had earned enough credits to go over two lanes, we did pay them for both of their lanes. But a pay freeze truly meant everyone made exactly what they did the year before. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Dr. Anderson, oh, when I'm sorry, John, oh, can I do a follow-up sure. on that? Did that take concurrence by your by your union with the new law? The uh, well, when we did it the first time, it did. Uh, when we did it the second time, we still did it. I mean, we wouldn't have imposed that on people. So both of them were done with the knowledge of all of the employees. So having their input. So, I mean, they realized that the choice was we either had to cut positions or basically freeze. As long as we are willing to do it equitably across the board, uh, 
people didn't like it. You know, I can't say anybody liked having their wages frozen, but when everybody's wages were frozen, it was a lot easier to take, so there wasn't any uh, animosity between one group and the other group. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Bill. Okay. Yeah, great. And, you know, I was just thinking of, uh, of with you coming from a district that's a little bit smaller and you have more accessibility, um, coming to a bigger district, that's kind of where my, my question is going. So, you know, there, there's enough differences with Midland Public Schools compared to where you were at Mount Horeb. And I'm thinking in terms of the size of the districts, the multiple programming, because I, I don't think you have IB, just as, right. as, as an example. Um, and, and looking at our need to implement technology improvements on a pretty large scale, multiple buildings and so forth. And then in particular looking at how uh, I think from your school district, you're a district that seems to add students. And we're a district that is contracting in student enrollment. Um, and also our budget is upside down and um, it needs to be balanced. Uh, what would your approach be with those differences in particular uh, if you're selected as the superintendent for Midland Public? Well, first, in relationships with people, irregardless if you have a smaller group or a large group, the process is still the same. Um, the method of accessibility and how often you're accessible uh, might be a little different, but I think what I would do is the first thing I would, as I would come in, as I said earlier, is one is to sit down with each of you so that I had true understanding of individually where each of you saw the strengths of the districts and where you saw your challenges and what your ideas would be. Then I would sit down with all of the administrators. Uh, what I currently do is sit down with all administrators in our district on a weekly basis. I know that uh, they have um, cabinet meetings here so that the administrators and superintendent meet on a monthly basis, but they meet with different groups. I'd probably try to arrange groups that uh, would allow uh, more communication. One thing um, is I'd try to probably create a group that was probably had more administrators on it, but not all administrators. In other words, have representative elementary principals, representative middle school principals, high school and assistant principals and the various ones. So we could have larger groups, but then find a way to connect with others. So it would mean scheduling my time, uh, you know, uh, instead of meeting with everybody at one time, maybe breaking it down so that, you know, on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock I met with group A, maybe Thursdays at uh, two in the afternoon I met with a different group. So it would be rearranging my calendar, but still the process of being able to meet with individuals to listen to them. Uh, it would mean basically just doing my calendar. I mean, whether uh, we have seven buildings, you have a lot more, but basically it means is structuring your calendar. In other words, you build the time in your calendar, so it says middle and high, Friday, 1 to 2.30, so that I so that everyone realizes that from that, on that time period that I'm going to be in middle and high, and from then... You know, just trying to walk through the halls initially, uh, talk to s staff members in the hall, talk to students, talk to the building administration. I mean, basically having a full calendar. But I'm a workaholic. I do my best work individually, the work that needs to be done, uh, paperwork, uh, early in the morning and late in the evening. One is because those are the quieter hours. Uh, as Saturdays, I don't work Sundays. I gave that up a number of years ago. But trying to figure out, you know, one of the times people are accessible, putting my calendar to have that accessibility, and one of the times more quiet where people may not be around, but I can get some of those other tasks done. You had some more questions, and I think I lost part of it. Yeah, there, there's just enough differences in terms of uh, a lot of technology to implement. There's a lot of programs like we have IB and a number of other initiatives we're looking at. So it would be a lot to orchestrate um, compared to your, your district, and so just the, how you would approach that. Well, you have more administrators that are in charge of various programs, so though there are more programs, you have individuals that are, have, um, that are basically in charge of those programs now we're supervising. Mm -hmm. So basically it's coordinating more with them so they keep me. Sure. And that office cabinet really isn't any larger, but it's just to make sure that they keep me updated on what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, my calendar I expect to be a lot, um, you know. I don't expect to be many empty spots in the calendar, but I think as people get to know me in accessibility, what it is is there will become a process in the thing I truly need uh, to be successful is I need to find ways to connect with uh, people not only within the schools but outside of the schools. And we're just finding where do various groups of people meet that I can be accessible to hear what it is they have to say. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Any follow-ups? Any follow-ups? Follow I have a follow-up. Oh, um, you mentioned that you did have an international baccalaureate program within mm -hmm. a three-district area. 
right, actually it's more than three years because we have the Global Academy that has the International Baccalaureate Program. So it's not housed in Mount Horb, but Mount mm -hmm. Horb students have access to it. But it's actually in, I think, two of the schools. And actually, I think there are seven schools in the consortium that actually have that program. So it's not that it's not available, but it's not housed in Mount Horb. But we have, we united because we knew we all couldn't offer, uh, we didn't have the resources to offer all the programs for all our students, but within the conglomeration, within the consortium, we could all offer programs to make them available to other students. And you also mentioned, was it a biotechnology academy? Well, we have, we have one of the, uh, we have our students that, um, we have a genetics company that actually is uh, in Mount Horeb. Okay. So biotech, so our students and other students in the consortium can go out and basically do apprenticeships in that uh, with, it's called Minitube, uh, but they do genetics, so they allow students uh, we have o uh, Project Omega, which is the same thing in Madison, so have different locations. Uh, Epic, of course, is a large healthcare system that you may have heard of. They deal with um, computer systems. So we have lots of businesses that allow the students not only from Mount Horror, but others to participate in an apprenticeship and work-study program. And we have quite a few of those students that are, you know, throughout the area, especially their juniors and seniors. One is because of transportation. Uh, by that time, they usually have... Um, driver's license. So, so that, oh, sorry, go ahead. So to be clear, those are work study and apprenticeships, not necessarily project-based learning in the classroom? Right, most of them are there. Uh, I mean, we have lots of different levels, but I would say the vast majority are where they're going. They're spending a certain amount of time, so um, some are, most are through our apprenticeship program, but we have work study programs, which may not be as often, where they get to go out and uh, basically have mentorships. Yeah. Sorry, somebody else had? Yeah. One of the first things I'll try to find out, are there places outside the school that large groups of parents like to congregate where they would like to meet? So one is, I'll always make available you know, meetings within school structures. But as I mentioned earlier, there are, there's groups of individuals who feel much more comfortable meeting outside the school structure. So be trying to find out where uh, people meet, where they would like to hold discussions, as I said, Earlier in my career, I did that at people's houses. Now, there's a lot of houses in Midland, <laughs> so that might be a little challenging. But it probably wouldn't be as challenging to meet if you know groups wanted to meet at the Fine Arts Center or if people wanted to meet at a community center. Someone even told me that a place where I want to connect with senior citizens is I need to go to big boys. You know, <laughs> In other words, there are places where people naturally congregate, and what I have to do is work in my, to find out where those places are to make myself available. Um, but I probably will. Tell people, if you would like, if you get your neighbors put together uh, and you would like to meet the new superintendent, I'll be more than happy to come to your house. Just uh, call me or, or call Cindy, have her put it on the calendar, and as long as there's not another meeting, I'll be more than happy to come out. My wife doesn't expect to see me for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. There's a follow-up question to that, but I <laughs> <laughs> Angela, cheers. All right. Um, I, wa I want to go back about 20 years to your dissertation that you did for your PhD. And um, so everyone else knows I'm reading it off your um, CV here. How school improvement teams gather and use information to make decisions regarding school improvement issues. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how you have used that in the last 20 years um, in your district and you know maybe some of the things that it's led you to do that you might not have uh, otherwise have done. One of the things that was pointed out is I studied uh, various school improvement teams, is one of the names that they were given at the time, uh, where buildings would get together and to solve uh, what types of questions did they take a look at, uh, which ones did they solve, which ones, and basically there's two types of questions. You have instructional and managerial. What basically research says is instructional decisions got talked about a lot, but nobody made a decision. The ones that got were managerial decisions, like uh, bell schedules, because they were easier, they didn't imp so those uh, got solved many more times than the instructional decisions. And the most interesting part, in fact, uh, my uh, professor used it for a number of years until he retired, is that where do people go to get information? 
and the, truly where most people get their information is first from their gut. In other words, what do I feel is the right decision? After you have a determination what you felt was the right decision, then you went to have that verified. You usually went to a colleague either in the district or the next you went to a colleague outside of the district. Very few people actually went to uh, places of research. So what basically we do is try to remind ourselves, uh, the way that we use in our district is that when we're making decisions, we have to look beyond just what we feel or what maybe one of our colleagues in a different one. What other piece of information do we know that would say this, uh, this should work, this might work, or that maybe we need to take a look at? Because just relying on how we uh, feel about it um, isn't very scientific. Uh, though it's the most common, it doesn't mean it's the most correct. My professor was extremely disappointed that you only went to universities about 1.5% of the time. <laughs> Any follow-ups? Scott. Uh, Dr. Anderson, my question um, is about risk-taking. You mentioned it's important to be a risk-taker to drive innovation and to advance the status quo. And um, I don't know if you addressed this or if it was even asked of you during your last interview, but can you tell us a little bit about some of the biggest risks that you've taken in the past to uh, benefit your district and, and what type of outcomes did they have? Okay. Some of the biggest risks, I think, um, I don't know that they're some of the most recent risks is that we're obviously putting in technology. And one of the things is that we want to go to something for one-on-one -on -one devices. We don't have the infrastructure right now. So what we've been working on is we have what's called coverage for our infrastructure, but we don't have saturation. So right now, one of the things that we're doing to take risk is that we have basically uh, taken a look at all of the access points and the company. Uh, and I'll leave the company unknown just in case they <laughs> operate in Michigan. But it wasn't doing so. What we had to do is find out, okay, so where can we go? We need to, we need to have a system that can support one-on-one -on -one devices. Our current system can't do it, so we have to try to find a way. So basically we negotiated with the company to buy back all of our devices at, at cost uh, and to put in a different one. So we're taking you know, basically a risk that we can redo the whole system to provide better coverage for not much greater cost. That's on a large scale, but most of the risk taking happens within the classroom. And it's in giving, um, a lot of it's been done with uh, technology in the last couple of years. We have teachers that want to teach differently. Uh, so one of the classes we had is in our intermediate center, which is grades three, four, and five. So one of our fifth grade teachers said, you know, the current way that I'm teaching with textbooks and all that, I think we could do a lot better job if you, if you let me not use textbooks for a year and you let me use the iPads. So we've got the iPads for his classroom. And then, uh, like one of the exercises I think I mentioned last time is, since I was an English teacher, they do writing exercises, and they're sending it out to various parties outside of their classroom to do their editing and rewrites. So, but it's a chance, because everybody else is using you know, the textbooks, but he's trying to do his without. Um, overall, I think it's going well, but there are you know, there's some differences and challenges is that one, um, the types of materials you can access um, are different. They're not, I'm not saying that they're, they're not uh, as good if they may be better, but they're different than what other teachers. So just trying to keep people at the same pace so that one group doesn't feel, geez, you know, we didn't cover this um, because we're doing it differently, but he's having success. We have another group doing it at the middle school. Uh, not the same, but using technology rather than textbooks. And we have another group using it at the high school. Uh, we just actually had our one of our board members go and visit that classroom so they could have an idea of, you know, how is that working because it is different. And uh, got rave reviews, so she loved it. She came back in and told the rest of the board. Uh, she belongs to the Rotary, so uh, the Rotary uh, provides us with uh, various amounts of funds for projects during the year. Brought in one of the international students uh, from a different country that's just visiting, came to get to see this. So these are all ways that we weren't currently teaching, but they wanted to try something, so we gave them the option to do that. I think one of our risks that we took on a larger district-wide, uh, which I think <coughs> has been beneficial, is our transportation. Uh, we are one of the few districts um, in the Dane County area, in fact, we're one of two, that run our own transportation system. Everybody else basically leases the transportation out. Um, but we think we get uh, actually better service running our own. So we were actually offered to uh, 
companies to buy out our fleet, which would have basically given us a huge capital outlay at one time. I think in the long term it would have been uh, disadvantageous for the district. But we took a look at it, studied it, and we agreed that we are going to buck the trend and we're continuing to run our system. Uh, so as of this point, uh, it still uh, makes the best decision for us. But, you know, they had to take risks that continuing to run their own system was going to be better than selling their uh, fleet, uh, bringing an influx of cash. They would also bought our bus garage maintenance building, so they would have been able to have uh, a fair amount of uh, additional fund equity. Uh, for a number of years, uh, we decided not to go that way, and at this point, I still think it's proving to be the best decision for the district. But not everybody agreed with it. All right. Do you see the implementation of one-on-one -on -one devices as a necessary risk, a necessary evolution, or both? I see that the way that we will not – there's no feasible way we can continue to operate teaching students in the same brick-and-mortar environment that exists ten years ago uh, that exists for a lot of parts today. Uh, society is moving too fast, the amount of information. So what we need to do is we need to teach students how to use the technology to access information and then to basically make decisions on how to use information. One of the things that we have found that uh, was the greatest difficulty with our students is knowing the difference between a fact and an opinion. It wasn't whether or not they could access information. It wasn't that they could read and understand the information. What they had their biggest issue with was determining what was facts and what was opinion because they basically determined that if they can access information and if somebody else has written it and somebody else has put their name to it, it must be a fact, and that's not accurate. So I think you need to end up changing. I think flipped classrooms is one way that people are using technology. In other words, Instead of having a teacher lecture in front of a classroom, what they do is they provide the lecture. Students can listen to that as many times uh, through uh, different devices on their own. And when they come into the class, they can take a look at, all right, what are the things that we need to do for coaching? I think having students sit for the same amount of time uh, every day of the week will change. I think you're going to take a look at classes and you're going to say, there's certain skill levels. Not everyone's going to get from point A to point D in the same period of time, but we want them to learn the same information. So what we're going to have to do is say, okay, is there different flexible ways that we can make the information available where instead of maybe people go uh, to a, a physical classroom two days a week and then maybe three days a week they're doing it by some other, uh, I'll say, electronic means and having teachers change their schedules. It may be that a group of students meets, you know, the best time for them to meet is at night. So the teacher schedule will be more fluid. It's not that they'll do any less work. It's just to do it in a different confine. I think that has to happen because I don't think our society nor do I think our students will allow us to continue to sit uh, repetitively the same periods of time over and over because that's not the way their normal life works. It's not the way they access information and make decisions now. So we need to take what they're used to doing and try to use that approach, you know, to say, if we apply that to various subject matters or various topics. Um, if I was a technology genius and I could find a way to build it into a game, <laughs> why I would do it because <laughs> students have an immense concentration to play for hours and hours to solve problems on various games to get from level A to level B. And, you know, they do it by trial and error and learning. They do it by communication in the larger networks or groups. So I think we have to change the way we do it. I think the... Uh, the electronic media, um, computers, and I use that loosely because I'm certain that in five years it will be a different type of a device, but using those devices to, you know, have students access and make decisions. Okay. Thank you. I have a follow-up uh, follow yeah. to that. You, you were talking about that you have a couple classrooms using iPads. Um, what measures have you put in place to really measure if it is a better, more effective way of learning? We have one of the things that we instituted, so we made certain that everyone has their different state tests. Michigan has theirs, Wisconsin, and now we all have the uh, basically national tests from the Common Core. But what we did is we aligned uh, so we had pre-tests and post-tests so that irregardless of what teacher is teaching uh, the subject matter or the grade level, there were certain skills. So we can simply take a look. The teacher that's using in fifth grade you know, how are they measuring their students against the other ones? 
So basically we're finding that they're doing as well as. Uh -huh. Now it, it varies within the classroom. Some students are, you know, obviously much more adept, but if you take a look at the classes as a whole, you know, the class is doing as well if it's not better than those that are using uh, what I'll call the um, paper text. So basically, and that was one thing we started a long time ago because we said, you know, the, basically the, uh, the larger assessments happen, you know, once or twice a year. Then we established maps so we could do that much more frequently. But we said, you know, we want to make certain that all of our students are delivered the same curriculum. How you teach the curriculum can vary with uh, your individual attributes, but we wanted to make certain the one way we could do that is when we had basically the teachers work together to say, okay, regardless of how we teach this, what are the things that we want students to know at the end of the various units, and what is a common test we could use so we know where they're starting and so we know where they're finishing. That also helps us point out areas that might be a weakness or that if uh, one teacher is scoring consistently lower in a certain area, then we can take a look at what reasons for that might be and how we can remediate that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just with putting them in connection with a different teacher. Did you did you find that the iPads worked better than any other device, or did you not have that level of comparison? We don't have that because we gave them all the same devices. Okay. So right now they're all using the iPads. What we're looking at for the bring your own devices is to basically have a list of probably um, four or five that our technology staff could operate, giving our staff money so they can buy their own and actually own it, the ones they feel most comfortable and providing a list to the students. The students know that if they bring one of these four or five devices, you know, they can bring their own from home. For individuals that don't have access, which really is a fairly limited number, then we'll actually have devices that they can use. As I mentioned, we will probably charge maybe a $50 piece so they have some skin in the game. Actually, I can't use the little ones because I don't know how people text, you know, <laughs> and how they write papers because it's not feasible for me. I do have one follow-up. So you are implementing the Bring Your Own Device uh, program? We will be implementing it, but we have to make sure. Right now we're in the stage of making sure we have wireless access points and then creating the policy so that we know which devices. So we basically created a three-year plan. So we've reviewed that with the board. It's still being modified. But the end result is to have every student have access to an electronic device that they can use in the classroom within a list of, like I said, four or five devices. My guess is um, this next year we will focus on the infrastructure. Um, it's being more challenging. One is because we had hoped to use our infrastructure we had and just to add to it that would have been more cost effective, but it just doesn't have the capabilities to allow the saturation level. Fortunately, as I mentioned, they were the company is uh, buying it all back at cost so that we can implement a different system so it does uh, so at least we're not taking a loss on the materials. Now we gave that company several times to prove that it could truly meet, and when it couldn't, then oh. you know, uh, then they said we'll buy them all back. Good job. And there's two school districts that I like to follow, and one's Fairfax County um, Public Schools. They have a Bring Your Own Device program that works very well, and they only allow one device, which is a Dell computer, and also Sa Saline Area Schools, which is in Michigan. They have their own bring your own device uh, that works, but they also negotiated with Dell a 40% discount for Dell computers to uh, make that work. And then they have, for every 10 computers they buy, they receive a free one, which uh, fits perfectly with their free and reduced lunch population. So that covers. You know, one of the big, one with a bring your own devices, we're hoping that a number of our students will actually bring their, truly their own device so that we don't have to purchase it. So it prevents the uh, purchase. Uh, another of the big things for success will be in training our staff. One of our neighboring school districts, in fact, I used to work with the school district, uh, made an investment to basically buy uh, devices for their entire, I think it's their entire high school, and then they were going to. But what they found out is that the teachers didn't use it any differently. So you know, there was no change because it was just whether I read the information on a hardcover text or read or, or whether I read it on the iPad. I think they actually bought laptops. It didn't change. So the method of instruction, and if you don't change the method of instruction, then then why make the investment? So a part of it, and parts of that is, is letting teachers who feel comfortable actually spearhead the effort because then they will, once people see this is successful, 
then they will uh, do it others. So I don't think you can do it all at one time, but I think you do it in pockets for those who truly want to make that move because they're more adept. And I'm certain in the Midland School District, it would be no different than in Mount Horb. We have some that are extremely adept at uh, using uh, different types of devices and know how to bring in video clips and all sorts of things. So it's, it's truly more engaging. Others, just because they're not of that generation, and you know, my guess is it would be much more of a struggle for me. Um, you know, there is probably not the investment, but the teachers that want to do the best. So what they will do is once they find out the teachers that are successful, you know, they'll start connecting with those teachers, and those teachers will say, look, if you go to these various sites, they'll help you pull on this type of material, and if you do this. And they'll do it until in, they get a little more comfortable and a little more comfortable. So even when I see that we finally do the implementation, my guess is we'll start with those teachers who truly want to do that. They're the risk takers. And then they will take the other ones with them. And there'll be a few that don't want to make the change. And eventually, uh, they will probably either feel so uncomfortable that they'll make the change or they'll feel so uncomfortable that they'll decide that the uncomfortability is not worth staying. Well, those two districts, the way they solve some of those problems, it, the district doesn't pay for the computer. They just offer, uh, they negotiated the discount for the parents. The parents go to their website to purchase it, so there is that standardization because we tried bring your own device with multiple uh, devices and it didn't work. And another um, way that they make that work is having a cross-platform with like Google Apps. So we use Google Apps. We have okay. lots of those. Oh, you do? Okay, good. That's good to hear. My next question is, unfortunately, our technology bond in Millage failed. Would you, what would you do differently, and when would you suggest we once again ask the taxpayers to a vote on this? Well, you know, the interesting part is when I went on the website, you had hired a consulting firm to come in and actually do uh, background information prior to uh, the referendum. and. Uh, and all the information that they had posted, you should have had an overwhelming, I mean, you had when it was, I think, 49, you know, percent was supporting, and you might have, you know, 15 percent that didn't. So uh, my guess is there was a reason why it didn't pass. So my guess is to take a look and try to figure out why didn't that happen. In other words, if the initial uh, surveys pointed to why it should pass, now you have to take a look and say, okay, where's the disconnect? Um, when I was here the last time, it had just failed, so, and it had been too long, too short a time to delve into any information, whether or not, you know, was it the number of voters that voted? If more voters would have shown up, would it have done the different? Was it the way that the information was communicated? I mean, I don't know, but what I would do is I'd start trying to disaggregate that data to determine what is it people, in fact, I would, Try to connect with individuals or groups that say, you know, why we didn't support it to find out what was it that made you not support it and what could have been done differently. Was it that you didn't have the information? Was it you just philosophically didn't agree with the principles? But to try to start it, then uh, once you start having a sense from the community, then they have a better idea of how soon you can come back to it. Like I said, I think people in the district will learn to trust me and to work with me. But that's not going to come in the first week or the first month. That'll take over the year. But during that same time period, I think, um, well, you might need it a lot sooner. I would say that if I started on July 1st, if you're to do it, um, if you like doing it in May and you did it the next May, by that time I could probably give you answers on either why you should go ahead because I think it'll pass and here's the things we need to do, or why I think this won't pass and what changes you might have to do before you bring something back that would pass or would gain their support. Follow-ups? Thank you. Lynn. All righty. <coughs> Dr. Anderson, could you uh, share any experience you may have had in establishing equity for children with differing needs, implementing the RTI model, and developing and evaluating gifted and talented programs? We actually started the RTI model a number of years ago. We've actually given presentations at Midwest symposiums on that. So what we did is uh, first we took the time to instruct the staff on what RTI meant. So that meant lots of different meetings so that people realized that we weren't eliminating special ed because that was one of the first things that people thought is, 
you're only doing this so we don't have any special ed population. It's like, no, RTI, response to intervention, is different. In fact, it's correlated with PBIS, which is a positive behavior intervention strategy. What we took a look at is what we want to do is we want to make sure that the curriculum that we have is being properly accessed and understood by all of our students. Um, roughly 80% of uh, your students should be getting it from the curriculum and the way that you deliver it. The second tier is 15% may need some interventions and the top 5% may need special plans. What we looked at in our district is that we actually have uh, intervention strategies for both gifted and talented and for our special needs population. One is because our, the gifted and talented are the most likely to drop out of school if they're not challenged. So we realized that we had to find ways to meet their needs. So uh, I believe every child can succeed. I believe every adult can succeed. I believe we're all gifted and talented and we're all disabled. We all have strengths, we all have weaknesses. Our job is to try to have people capitalize on their strengths and minimize their weaknesses. So we've spent a great deal of time is trying to figure out what are the interventions that we can use and are we doing things with fidelity? Because we came to recognize that in our reading programs, they wanted 90 minute blocks. We weren't offering 90 minute blocks. We were offering 45, 50 minute blocks. It wasn't giving us the, um, the results we had thought. So we were thinking, should we basically, um, should we stop using this one and look at some other ones? Before we did that, we said, you know, one of the things is it says you need 90 minute sustained blocks. So we modified our schedule um, so that we actually double booked some classes so that, you know, so it's like a two periods. Uh, this actually did, um, this helped because, you know, then the students truly had the 90 minutes. So when we offered the program with fidelity, the results were, you know, you know, what we had expected. So we didn't have to change that program. When we take a look at the various interventions, we say, first, what is it that we have available? And then what is it that will best meet the needs of the students? The hardest thing for our teachers is the what I'll call the record keeping and the bookkeeping. We have weekly meetings uh, within each of our buildings that talk about student progress. So if there's students that are um, uh, in the 20% that's not being met, then we say, okay, what is it? And we have different groups of individuals working on what are the interventions and then reporting back whether or not the interventions are, are being successful or not. If they're not, then we try to research what different interventions that we can use. Um, it, it doesn't eliminate the need for one-on-one -on -one plans. We have one-on-one -on -one plans for both special education and for gifted and talented, but they're because the first tier interventions aren't working. So, um, but you know, our teachers work together. So I mean, what they truly do is we have, as I said, weekly meetings where teachers are talking about the students and getting ideas from each other on here's things that programs that I'm using that are working so that we have a larger group of interventions. That was our biggest downfall in the beginning is that the teachers knew the ones that weren't succeeding. We just didn't have a lot of different types of interventions to meet their needs and we had to develop what are the resources we have and how can they be commonly available to students across the district. Thank you. And as, as I'm sitting here, I was thinking um, credit recovery especially at the high school level. Um, do you have a plan or a program that you specifically employ for that? Right, one of the most common that we use is actually, this is uh, where we use uh, virtual education. So we, one, we allow students to retake, but we also have lots of uh, courses uh, either that we make available or that we can bring in from the outside where students, if they can't during their regular period make up the time, we help them um, and we have certain, um, we have several at-risk programs in our school that are of different levels and depending on what the child, I mean, um, for credit recovery, for one group of our students, it's not that they don't have the ability to do that. What their issue is is they don't have the attention span. So they basically have an instructional coach that keeps them motivated to get lessons completed. We have a different group that, uh, you know, I need to catch up because, you know, the subject matter and the way of friends was too difficult. So then we have various labs where they work with individuals so they can recover that credit. A lot of it's done through uh, um, what I'll call purchase software to give us a means to catch them up without waiting a whole semester. Okay, thank you. Follow-ups? I have one. 
Uh, you said you started the URTI model for both gifted and talented and uh, special needs um, several years ago. Have you measured any difference in outcomes for those students since then? I mean, what's the difference between where you were and where you're at today based on outcomes? We've always been fairly successful. So, I mean, when we have, we're continually ranked um, <coughs> when we're tested against others. So I can tell you that we give report every year to the board on uh, various where our assessments are. They've risen almost every year. I think one year we were a little bit flat. We still increased, but not with our normal. But I think uh, during the past five years, now whether or not it's for RTI, that I can't tell you, but I can tell you that the, the our ACT scores, our WKC scores, our MAP scores, our DIBL scores, the various assessments all have been on a steady increase. For, for total population, mm -hmm. for total population. You'd mentioned that you were concerned that gifted and talented often drop out or whichever way you want to view that when they're not challenged. Have you seen a difference there in terms of either dropouts or engagement by your gifted and talented since you've done RTI? We almost have no dropouts. I mean, I can't say that we every year we have 100% graduation because graduation rates in Wisconsin are measured by the students that start their freshman year. Well, some aren't in our school district when they're seniors, but for the students that go across, um, we're in the high 90s of percent every year. But we take special effort if there's any type of an issues to work with those, uh, to work with any of the students in regards to where they fall on the spectrum to make sure that we identify them early and work with them and their parents. So um, we almost have, like I said, in the high 90 percent, so we've been able to work with students. For our students that we do have a, a small group of students, I would say probably um, we'll average about 10 a year. And what we have is what's called the GEDO program. Uh, which means because of errors that they probably made their freshman and sophomore year, they're not going to get a traditional diploma, but they can get an equivalency diploma by being able to demonstrate that they have a certain skill set. So when we count those, then we might only lose one or two students a <coughs> year. And sometimes, most of the time, that's for social factors and not for educational factors, for something that's went on in their life that basically is taking education so it is of no priority in their life. And I wish I could say we got all of those, but the answer is, you know, some have different things going on. One of the things that uh, what I have always said we can do is you can always come back to our school. So if you're 19 and you want to come back, you can come back and finish up. So we actually have some that, you know, that uh, say school is not for them. Find out that going out and trying to get a job when they don't have a high school diploma or some type of training is uh, almost impossible. And they actually do come back and re-enroll for a fifth year. Um, you know, we probably have a, during, I don't know, maybe over the last 17 years, but I would say over the last decade. And we might average uh, two a year to come back for a fifth year. And they are actually our best salespeople for our at-risk students because they actually tell them, if you think you can blow this off and go and be successful, let me tell you, I have no desire to be back here for a fifth year when there's nobody that I went to school with, but I couldn't make it. So they're actually our best people to keep some of our, that would think about not coming to school, come back to school. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Anderson, in your first interview, you said that you've had to cancel some programs because they weren't producing results. And I was wondering if you could identify some programs for us that were actually cut and, and talk about factors that led to the decisions, how you decided what programs to cut. Well, we had, um, we had a reading program we were using in our elementary school. Um, so, and we were actually spending a fair amount of time. It was a ready reader program that we were pulling out students to sit down with uh, um, in small numbers uh, with either a paraprofessional or a teacher and basically found out that the amount of resources we were putting in that our numbers weren't decreasing. In other words, as they went from grade level to grade level, they continually, I mean, we added to our numbers. We weren't decreasing our numbers. We were increasing our numbers. So after, and we held on to it for longer than we should have. Uh, so I think after about, we noticed that we weren't getting results probably after, I'm going to say five or six years. But sometimes years, you know, what I think is a short time is a longer time. So 
but we noticed we weren't getting results, so we thought, so we kept talking to the reading teachers, you know, why is this, you know, why, why is it that we start out the year, we identify 15, and we're supposed to actually, we were hoping to, be, you know, be down to five so we could put another 15 in. <coughs> and what we're finding is that the initial 15, really nobody's exiting the program, and we're putting more programs, so we would have just more and more students. And we said it's impossible. We can't have this many kids, you know, per grade level that can't, you know, that are having this much difficulty in reading. Um, you know, and it's simply, I can't tell you all the reasons why it didn't work, because I don't know that I know, but we knew that it didn't. We've changed it. Um, we actually did put reading specialists where we concentrated more in our very first levels, but more working instead of pull out, working with the teachers to teach the teachers how to better instruct reading. And then, you know, we give a multitude of assessments uh, earlier, at much earlier level. So we found out that we still have students that have difficulty reading, but not nearly as many as we did before, and it's not having a cumulative effect. Thank you. Follow we up. have one program that's on the bubble, though, that if it doesn't dramatically change, it will be cut, and that's probably uh, a FACE, Family and Consumer, was Family and Consumer Economics. It's just changed. Now it's Family and Consumer Science. At our high school level, it's adapted, and I think it's still meeting the needs of students at our middle school level. It's, uh, for whatever reason, uh, it hasn't been adapting. So my guess is, is that, um, well, probably the only reason we haven't dropped the program, to be totally honest, is that the teacher who's teaching it has been in our district for a long, long time. And to basically cut it means you're telling her she doesn't have a job and, you know, she spent her whole life there, so I think we're waiting until she retires and then we'll revamp the program. Not probably the best answer I should give, but it's the most honest answer is that should it have been a different, we probably would have either uh, totally overhauled the program or we would have replaced it with something else we think is more relevant to our kids. I do have a heart on, so it, sometimes the uh, As heart part makes of that it reading, that. do you have a, a, do you have preschool at Mount Horeb or? We have uh, we have five year old kindergarten. We have many daycare providers, and we work with our daycare providers to help them with our curriculum. Most districts in Wisconsin have four year old kindergarten. We are one of the very few districts that don't have four year old kindergarten because our board doesn't believe that they think it would be a surrogate daycare, and they don't want to enter into that relationship. But what they have allowed us to do is to send out our director of curriculum instruction and our principals and our basically our reading specialists to work with each of the daycare providers so we meet with them so we could we can tell them the things that the students should know by the time they enter kindergarten. So we don't have a four year kindergarten. We don't run the daycare providers, but we do work with the daycare providers, um, the Montessori schools. We have several different types that provide preschool education. We do work with them so they all understand. And they've come to the board and talked with the board, you know, that if we decide to implement 4K, we will implement it, providing it uh, basically through these providers instead of an in-house. We'll provide it through the providers so that uh, um, they don't lose income, so we're not pulling the students away from them. So right now what we're doing is we're working with them so they can, as the students get older, they can uh, basically prepare them for kindergarten. Well, and you said you have building capacity issues. Do you have that at the elementary where your elementaries are too full? Or? Well, uh, we don't have any of the preschools in our building. Right. Is it because your um, elementary schools are too full or just because you don't want to take business away from? Just I think for the second is more just because right now the board doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to, could we? Yes. Uh, after we finished our building project with our primary center, I mean, we have the capabilities to free up enough classrooms that were we to start a four-year-old K program, we would have the classroom space to do that. But we have some of our board members that are adamant that if one daycare provider is, you know, basically going to have to uh, lay off some one or more of its employees, um, they don't want to go through those options yet. But we are one of the very few that don't have four-year-old kindergarten. Four-year-old kindergarten is a way to generate revenue in the state of Wisconsin because ours are based on student populations. So if you add another grade level, you know, for our district, an average grade level is 200 students. Well, if 
you had 200 students and you get an average of $8,000 per student, well, you know, right there, you have, you know, another, you have a fair uh, chunk of change that you can operate with. But at this point, we're not doing that. Uh, I think it'll be looked at more closely this year. In fact, I know it's on our agenda for today's Monday, next Monday's meeting, okay. is to talk about four-year-old kindergarten again because, you know, so we wouldn't, we, there's no feasible way we could implement it next year. There's not time, but we could maybe study and say, you know, are we looking at implementing a year from now? We do have some new board members and they have an interest in four-year-old kindergarten, so we, mal, we might have a majority of the board that now wants to look at that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess it's to me. Um, in your last interview, you gave a few comments on your thoughts on 21st century learning, um, but not necessarily specific things you started in Mount Horeb or you would like to have started in Mount Horeb or here if you come. Can you comment on what specifically 21st century learning means to you and what things you would see forward for Midland uh, in that regard? I think 21st century learning means taking a look at what the way that we deliver the curriculum. I don't think it's so much on the content knowledge, you know. We'll never be able to deliver all the content knowledge because basically the content's increasing every day. But I think it's delivering so that students know how to access information then make decisions using that information. So I think it's changing the classroom. Um, so it's more than, you know, uh, how much information can I get to where do I go to access information? And once I have that information, how can I use it to solve some real world problem? I mean, one of the things that we, that I mentioned earlier is that we would the, the global academy and we tried to, we, we all knew that we couldn't um, provide all the programs, but we knew working together but we also knew that there's various teachers in different districts that had um, better success rates with certain programs so that it, it made teachers, I'm trying to say this in the, in the way, it's not that they had better teachers, but certain teachers in certain subject matters seem to, you know, can produce a higher level. So it basically made that we could all use our best, you know, the best teachers in certain subject matters would be available to a greater number of students. Now that may not be something new, but it is something, a way to look at education rather than saying, you know, if we can't have everything ourselves, what we might be able to do is we might be able to share resources with different bodies. And I think what we'll take a look is expanding it into, you know, um, we already have it in the colleges, but I think we'll look at expanding it even to businesses. Businesses, things that they can choose as different corporations, I think instead of maybe teaching whole units, there's certain skill sets that I think our students could access or bring in people from um, the outside that can help instruct students on real world skills and make things more meaningful to them that they can take with them. So I think it's the way that we deliver the information and how students will make decisions. Um, any experiences directly with implementing project learning, project-based learning? Closest that we would have is what I would tell you is that, as I mentioned, we're the longest running builder. That probably is the best project-based course that we have because students actually truly build a house and they take a great deal of pride. So we have different groups of students that design every year. Um, students have to take uh, various prerequisites to get to this course so they just can't sign up for it but then they truly put all the things that they've learned from the various courses into a product that people live in. So for project-based, that is the best project-based course that we have in Mount Horeb because um, people drive by. We have actually displays of all the houses that we build, so uh, we have programs every year so that we can show all of the houses and uh, show people what they do. For a project-based, that probably is has a best hands-on project that we have. Now, we've had other programs that I would say are projects-based. Um, as I mentioned, I think last time, one of our math teachers had written a book in cartography. He actually takes his students. So one year we actually, they went on a sailing vessel where they actually had to use the lessons of cartography to how to plot their course through the stars, you know, how to navigate. I don't know how to do that, so I can't tell you exactly how they did it but they had to take the information they used and use it in a practical situation. Uh, we have also had them, uh, we have students uh, that do service learning. We have a great deal of service learning for project-based. 
In fact, right now, I would say we just had our awards banquet, um, and we give out what we call silver cords. Silver cords are for you need to work a certain number of hours uh, for the community uh, without pay. And right now, I think this year, out of a class of about 180, I think um, 45 to 50 put in enough volunteer hours to become silver cord recipients. So in a way, they're taking their learning, they're going out, they work for a variety of um, um, businesses. And when I say work, they do volunteer work, but they go in daycares, they go for the Chamber of Commerce, they go for the library. Um, to do different tasks that they've learned in school to bring to a practical application. And our community loves that. I mean, they just, um, they um, are overjoyed because they get to see the fruits of what the students have learned and they get to benefit and they connect with the business community. Okay. Any experience or thoughts or knowledge of how to implement project-based learning into a core curriculum? Not just you know, for certain things for like house building and things of that nature, but uh, cost all core curriculum. Not that I can think of right now, but I'm certain when I am leaving, I'll kick myself and maybe I can tell you at supper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the end of my question. Any follow-ups to that? John? Okay. Uh, my question is relating to curriculum and uh, course offerings. Um, can you give an example of a tough change that you had to make to the core course offerings at uh, Mount Horeb and how you went about doing it? And meeting that challenge? We really haven't had that issue because, like I said, we've grown in student population every year except two, one stable and one slight decline. Mm -hmm. As far as the number, the, the type of subjects, and the, if, if you had one, how would you go about resolving um, you know, where a course doesn't fit anymore or you can't offer that number of courses? Well, we have dropped, we, I mean, we've, we have stopped dropping courses at the high school if there wasn't enough interest. So it wasn't fiscal, it's just that we basically, if um, we have a policy that you need at least 15 students to run a class, mm -hmm. so we have certain uh, classes that um, may not have 15, so in certain years we may not offer them. Now, we have made exceptions where we have combined classes. Uh, French was dwindling. We had more and more of our students taking Spanish fewer and fewer of our students taking French. So we had to do combined classes to make that. We actually had to reduce the number of teachers um, two years ago because those numbers had um, basically greatly reduced. So we still offer it, so it's not that we don't offer the class. We just don't have as many recipients and we did have to basically um, have one teacher do an exploratory in the middle and then go to the high school and teach it because we didn't have enough students. So we used to be able to offer it uh, full time in the middle school and full time in high school. There wasn't enough interest. We've had to take certain um, classes that may not have met the minimum uh, and not offer them. Some we've offered every other year because we found that we didn't have the interest maybe each year, but we could offer them every other year. We offer classes in uh, horticulture and those, so some of those are more popular than others. We didn't want to drop them from the curriculum, but we may not offer them every year because they may not have the student body uh, to support the class every year. Is that what you mean? Yes, yes, and and uh, and I think what you, what you're alluding to a little bit is that sometimes a course offering may not be relevant to the curriculum because good curriculums change over time. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, you know, MPS has a process uh, with what's called a major program change. Um, do you have a similar type of process where if you did make a change, how do you get input on to bring up a new course or to change that? We have, we do that through our education committee. So we actually have a timeline set that we have, um, if we're going to look at offering a new course or if we're going to look at basically eliminating course because it hasn't had enough enrollment to justify it. Right. We start with a, a board committee, it's our education committee where our, depending on the subject area, the teachers for that subject area, Usually the building principles that, that it will impact mm -hmm. start. They work with our director of instruction and they go over what the issue is for either the new courses or the courses that um, just haven't had enough. We mm -hmm. talk that over with the board. We start those in September and October. The board then, uh, the committee basically tries to come to consensus uh, in November and bring it for full board discussion in December because we put out our course guide, especially for high school, in January, so we need to have those. So what we do is we start basically reviewing
courses at the beginning of the year, usually from what we had in the previous year. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That, that gave me what I needed to know. Thank you. Here's the. All right. Um, right now, things are changing so fast with the government and how they're funding education and all the changes that they're making. What do you do to stay up to date on what's going on, not only in lo from a local state level, but also a national level with education? And yep. do you personally do it, or do you have someone in your you know, organization that's kind of the point person for staying up to date on all the changes? Well, up to about seven, eight years ago, I was much of the belief that just let me run my district and don't bother me, all right? So I, I really didn't pay that, paid as little attention to the legislature as I could until I found out how much impact the legislature basically had and they wouldn't just leave me alone. So that's when I became actively involved in both our local association. So now I'm the president of the Wisconsin area of uh, school district administrators. And I'm also on the, I was on the governing board. I served two terms there. And I'm on the executive committee. So now we meet with legislators both on the, uh, on the state level and on the national level on a regular basis. So I actually meet those individuals and talk about the what impact their decision is having on our school districts, and we, you know, we usually bring them reports. Um, we meet um, twice a year in Washington. So, I mean, one of the things is if you were to offer me the contract, one of our first discussions would be as the next national meeting, and they pay for that, so the district doesn't pay for this. The organization actually pays for this, but it's usually the second week of July. So it'd be like, okay, well, if I go for the to meet with them. It means I have to be gone for like three days as soon as I start. But I think we're having more impact on, sh on um, showing them how things are changing. One of the things that I think is having impact in Wisconsin right now is, like I said, our governor's proposed zero. Basically, at the last budget, we were cut almost $500 per student. So we had expected an increase, and we had a huge decrease. That was just devastating across the board. But since that time, uh, we've worked as an organization to basically work with certain Republican legislatures in Wisconsin um, to be, that we think can change the majority just enough so that we get some change. And right now, uh, some of our representatives, though they don't represent my district directly, because mine is actually represented by uh, two people that are Democrats and are already uh, all in favor. So we're working with uh, five Republicans um, right now, it looks like we may have an opportunity uh, to go to $150. It's even been thrown $200. Uh, so I think that there's an opportunity that that has had an impact, and that's directly where our association, and as I said, I'm the president of the association, is working. Um, we do at a grassroots level, so basically, we have 424 of us, and you know, uh, we have. Um, and individuals will lobby us, then will send us legislative alerts. And as they send us the alert, then we know here are specific talking points that we can talk about. We've had the legislators out to our school district to look around and talk with them on a first-hand basis. For, it's not that difficult for us because um, our representatives, uh, you know, generally are supportive of putting forth more aid. But I will tell you, when they were in power, they didn't want to talk about finances either. So, uh, though now they're not in power. Uh, but overall, I think that we have worked to make some inroads. And on a national level, um, I think we've opened more discussion. Uh, but the bottom line is the last two years, I mean, they've been pretty upfront saying, don't ask for money. There is no money. You know. So what we've tried to soften is through the sequester, because that was going to take immediate effect. So at least we were able to talk and delay that until July 1st, so it didn't start when everybody else started there. So I think, yes, I meet with legislators. Uh, a number of years ago, I wouldn't have, but uh, I know they have an impact. So they're just like any other people. You try to convince them and show them what the impact is having on your district and why they might want to reconsider. So I'm more involved now than I ever thought I would be. Thank you. Follow-ups? Scott. OK. I may have the last question for you yeah, before you we um, <laughs> head off to dinner. Do you have any unfinished business at Mount Horb that may give you pause when you consider coming to Midland? And 
after you answer that, can you describe for us the legacy that you may leave behind there? Well, I'm meeting with, I, right now I'm meeting with the person who's going to take over for me. And we had a long meeting the other day, and I told her she needed to start coming to the board meeting because one, this was going to be her board because the elections had been over, and the Affordable Care Act. So that's the one that won't be, I mean, it really doesn't go into effect where all the full ramifications will be until July 1st, 2014. However, what starts July 1st, 2013 will, you know, basically set the groundwork for what happens there. So I'm trying to make as many of those things complete so that she doesn't have to deal with it. But like I told her, I said, you know, I only have a couple meetings left. If, it, if, if the board doesn't resolve it and doesn't make a decision, then this is going to carry over and you have to, you know, you, this is an issue that has to be solved. I mean, it, if we allow it to go, then it's going to basically cost us between three quarters of a million and a million dollars of revenue that we don't have. And I, and basically I um, told her, I said, part of my legacy is I've went 17 years and people realize we haven't had layoffs. So people have been secure jobs. I said, if this isn't resolved, your very first year, you're going to have to lay off staff. I said, is that what you want is on your very first year that you're going to have to lay off staff after 17 years where you haven't had layoffs? You don't want to start it that way. And we can prevent it, but there has to be some decisions made right now. And our board, I mean, our board has big hearts. I mean, they really do. So we have our paraprofessionals that, you know, are going from um, 35 hours to, say, 25, 26. That's having an impact on their families. I mean, they're appreciative they have a job, but losing 10 hours a week is having an impact. So, you know, I am, uh, they have a meeting tonight, and that's one of the main topics tonight. So my business manager is actually running that tonight. But if, the, if for some reason they decide to push the decision off and they say that they'll let all of the individuals come back at their same hours next year, because budgetarily I can make it work for 13, 14. I mean, I can make it work for this year because it doesn't have to be the same like plan. They can be different plans. But then the, it's going to be devastating in 14, 15. So probably that's probably the largest problem that I don't know that it will be able to be solved in the time that I'm there. The legacy I think that I will leave with our district is one, um, I mean, when I say I, <coughs> That's a composite group because there's nothing that I as an individual have done, but there's what I working with lots of other individuals. I think um, <coughs> that basically having referendums so that our facilities are in really good shape and we have enough facilities so that we're, you know, we still have room to grow. I think the legacy that we're a growing school district, you know, where 80% of the school district in Wisconsin have declining enrollment. We still have students that are in parents and families that are moving into the district when they could move into a multiple <coughs> other districts. Um, I think basically in creating a, relation, a relationship with staff that uh, we truly work together to solve issues. So it wasn't that any one person had to have it, but we worked together. And um, you know, though the solution sometimes may not be what we wanted, people realized that everybody had a part and in the end, it was the best that we could do with the information resources we had. Um, and people wanting me to stay. I think, you know, it's always nice as I always wanted to leave when people wanted me to stay and I think that's still the case. So I think that people will remember that, you know, during the tenure in which I was there, um, we grew financially, we grew in facilities, we grew in students, and we grew having basically a very supportive uh, staff and community for the school district as a whole. And I'm not saying that didn't exist before, but I'm saying that they grew during my tenure. Okay. Well, we've evenly gone around the table. <laughs> um, I would incite unless there's a very pressing, pressing question that's, that's gnawing at you. Uh, we can recess at this point to move on to dinner. You'll be able to ask us some questions about Midland when we're at dinner. Uh, won't be interviewing during that. Uh, it's uh -huh. an open meeting, but we won't be <laughs> asking him questions we'll allow him to ask us questions um and uh we'll go from there um one thing i regret did not do at the beginning of the meeting too in my haste to get to dr anderson the purpose of our meeting is ask if anybody in the audience had anything they wanted to ask of the board uh, we have no formal requests uh anybody want to address the board <laughs>
<laughs> for, for the listening audience, that's uh, Rick Oley, former board member, <laughs> citing that. Okay, that said, uh, we will stand recessed and we will meet in 20 minutes uh, at the H for dinner. Thank you Thank very you much. Very much Thanks for, for the coming, opportunity. Bro. Appreciate it, and I get to see you all in a few minutes. Yep. <laughs> I said I'd call my wife. Um, are we going to meet in a particular location? Um, Cindy? I'll go to my There's a series room. of meeting rooms on that okay. first main level, or the main level, if you want to call it that, on the street, the main street level, not the back street level. Okay. Okay. Wait, is it at the table or no? No, we're, we're in our own meeting room. Oh, okay. Okay. We, we wanted a private room. Stand recessed.